Okay, cool. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to. <laughs> My name is Aaron Lee. Yeah, okay, we can skip all that crap. Uh, okay, so uh, next up, we're just going to get into some slightly more complex stuff. So I've been fiddling with Niagara for um, for quite a while now, um, just trying to come up with a few different use cases. So. I've created a few particles, uh, and I'd like to try and get through um, just as many of those as possible, um, really, and, and see if any of them are of interest. So just to give you a quick overview, uh, I've got a few. I'm just going to load these up. Let's not save that. Uh, so one of the use cases that um, I definitely see is uh, implementing a potential fur system for your uh, for characters uh, and for, for objects. Uh, so what I've done here is I've simply taken the plane, uh, I've used the pivot offset, set the normal to be uh, the normal of the skeletal location, fed in the, the uh, skeletal location, um, and again, this is just the deer from the kite demo. And then basically read the texture data at that point and then just plugged it in. Right, really, really simple, um, stupidly easy. Uh, and what's great about that is that it updates uh, the location. So you can actually have your skeletal mesh uh, moving and updating, and it will go through and it will do that. Um, if I go over here as well, I've done the exact same thing just to a plane, but I've done a little bit of uh, animation inside the shader as well, so you can get some uh, quite nice effects really quickly. Uh, this one has a little bit of normal angle control as well, so you can kind of uh, actually control the, the facing of the normals so you can create proper uh, fur control. Uh, so downsides to this at the moment, if we just take a look and get a little bit uglier, you can see that we do have some slight updates uh, issues. So this is an optimization to how, uh, uh, to how the particles are updating uh, for the mesh. So you can see that they're not quite doing the same. Um, and this is a slightly hacked version, because at the moment, if you're reading in skeletal data, you can't read in that texture data. Uh, so in order to get this to work, um, you actually need to bake down um, your fur size uh, and your fur normal that you want to go to inside the vertexes of the, uh, of the skeletal mesh that you're doing. Um, luckily, um, the actual mesh itself, you can upload a texture. So it's just bringing that texture in, manually writing it to that object. Uh, next up, just on the same vein, uh, so I've built a, yeah, we can close that. Uh, I built a scarf and then basically uh, just spawned a ton of little kind of fuzzies on top of that. Uh, so you can kind of see the base one here and then uh, I'll zoom in on this. You can just create a load of little kind of fluff on top of your object, just to give it a little bit more depth and detail. Uh, so these are quite high-end effects, um, but as we move towards a more uh, unified system, uh, getting these onto the GPU um, could be incredibly powerful um, in terms of what we're doing. We could go from rendering a few thousand to a few tens of thousands uh, on, on our characters. And then the uh, particle that I'm going to be digging into uh, today uh, is this one. So, <laughs> so this is uh, a s basically just a school of fish. Um, you can whack this up much higher. It starts to get a bit ugly, though, I found. Uh, I like having a few of the gaps in there. That's where artists just ignores reality. Um, so what this, uh, these fish are doing is this is a s these are standalone particles. Um, so you can just place them in anywhere in your scene and they will just start moving around. They don't have, uh, at the moment, character dependency, so they aren't looking at where the character is and moving around them. So if you start moving in, uh, they will just ignore you and carry on. Um, but that's absolutely something that you could add uh, very easily to the system. Uh, so each of these, there's a few of them in here. I kind of just dropped a few in. Um, they're basically taking a range uh, and then picking a location within that range. So let's open it up and dig in uh, and see uh, if we can figure out how it's made. Uh, so just first off, uh, there is a little bit of mesh trickery going on in here as well. So you can see that uh, I've built a little uh, vertex animation, which just gives that kind of like a little bit of extra movement. Uh, this is if you're using the mesh. Um, I also have a version of this which uses the sprites, which means that you can actually use this at the GPU level and have uh, one 
metric ton of fish in your scene if you were so inclined. Uh, so I'm just going to open up the emitter. And you can see we've got uh, a few variables here, but on the whole, it's actually uh, it's it's pretty simple, right? There's there's not a whole lot uh, to these bits. Um, so I start off um, by setting a few variables, uh, and these are variables that I'm making. Uh, so one big thing with um, with Niagara is that the naming conventions are really important because they specify the domain uh, of the actual parameter itself. Uh, so all of these uh, in the emitter level, if you want them to be affecting within the emitter, need to start with emitter dot and then whatever the variable name is. Uh, so all I'm doing is I'm setting a few cycles, uh, a few variables. And then in the emitter update, so this is, remember, the emitter. So there's only one of them per scene. Uh, inside the emitter, I've made a module called wonder. I'm just going to open that up. Now, the way that wonder works is it basically uh, picks a location and then moves a variable to that location over time. So uh, to do that, it's a bit of simple maths. We basically take the target and our current location. Uh, yeah, uh, We subtract those from one another, normalize, multiply by speed. So what that's doing is it's basically giving me a normalized uh, direction and then multiplying that by the speed that I want to go to. And then I just add that uh, back in uh, to, my, uh, to my variable. So I'm just taking my current location and then I'm adding a little bit to it in a particular direction and then setting that as the new location. That gets set as my wonder location. And then I also have a check on that as well. So I'm getting that subtraction and finding the length of my vector. And then I'm saying, if that length is less than 200, then I want you to change the target location. Okay, So it's basically going to be, here's my target location. Here's my object. It moves. And as it gets past that 200 point, that if statement changes, and it picks a new point, and then that object goes to that one instead. Okay, um, So again, really simple. Uh, and then I have region min and region max. That's just giving me a new random, uh, random vector uh, within those two ranges that I set. Now, I've got a few different types here. Um, hopefully, you've noticed. I've got emitter and I've got module. Module is really useful because these are variables that you want the player, or not the player, sorry. That's getting to game dev there. Uh, so that's something that you want to be able to set and change inside the emitter. So if we have a look at this uh, variable, wonder, uh, this module, you can see that I have a region max, a region min, and a speed that I'm able to set. And this is really, really useful because uh, rather than it just doing some stuff on the back end and then spitting out some variables on the back end, what we can actually do is we can feed stuff in. So if I want to expose this in Blueprint, uh, I can. So I can actually set uh, ranges um, you know, kind of really easily within that. Uh, and then the same with speed as well. If I want that thing to move around really quickly, I can just change that variable there. But there's a problem with this, right? Um, I want my fish to be moving in quite an organic way, and going from here to here to here to here is not going to look that organic. It's going to be quite uh, jagged, a movement change, right? So what I want to do is I want to curve uh, that movement. And that's a really simple thing to do. Uh, all I need to do is basically add a follower, right? So if you imagine that that's my movement, going to kind of like the point of a triangle, and that's a sharp turn, yeah? And what I want to do is I want to curve that. So if I create a wanderer, what that will do is it will start moving with it. And then as it reaches that point and turns off, my wanderer will just curve round and follow it, right? Trying to do that in hand movement is like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what I do once I've set uh, my wander location and my wander target, I'm then getting those values uh, and basically following. So I'm creating a new tr a new vector, which we, again I've created here. So if you want to create a new vector, you just do that by uh, adding, uh, and you can choose uh, what you want. If I can vector, 
So we have all these different properties here. We have emitter, we have module, uh, we have other if we don't want to set that. Stop going. And we even have particles as well. So every time uh, we create one of these elements, that automatically gets added when we add the module to our, uh, to our, uh, to our system. So you can see that all of these variables here, if I go to the emitter level, you can see that they've been added uh, to my collection. So even though I've made uh, you know, kind of these things and they're not immediately visible, they are there, they're just on the back end. So I've got my wonder trail, wonder location, and module speed. So I've taken that same speed variable, I've halved it, um, and I feed that into my direction. So basically, I've created another component that is just following uh, that end product. And then I'm setting that back in. So I've created my target. So I have that object is moving around the scene. Now I need to let my particles know that they need to follow uh, that trail. So if I go down to my particle location, I have an initial sphere location which I'm setting. That just gives me a little bit of variation with each of the, uh, each of the fish. Uh, I'm also doing a, a few other bits as well. So I'm giving them a random uh, move speed within a different range. Uh, I'm setting a color range as well just to give them a little bit of ver uh, color variation. Uh, and then I have a, a data uh, element which I've made called velocity update. Uh, so this is really useful, uh, and I'll uh, get back to that in, in a second. So uh, particles update, obviously, this is something that I want the fish to continually do. Um, you'll notice that I don't have an update age in here, and that's because I don't need one. Um, I don't care what the age of my particles are because they, there's no point at which I want them to, to die. Uh, there's points where I might want them to stop rendering or I might want to deactivate the, uh, the emitter, um, but there's no point where I just want you to go, okay, fish, you've lived for eight years, now I want you to die, right? I just want them to just continually swim around the scene. So I've made a new module called Move2, and again, it's using the exact same uh, maths as before. I'm just doing a subtraction, uh, but in this instance, I also have an offset module, uh, and that's because I found that getting all the fish to move to a single point in space ended with a lot of pinching, right? So each of the fish basically has their own offset of that location, right? So they're all going towards a set one. And again, I set that at spawn because if I was setting that update, you generally find that they average towards the center because that thing is just updating all the time. Uh, so they end up just pinching anyway. So I take that module, I add it to my target location, so that gives me a slight offset, uh, but still follows that base, uh, base movement. Subtract those to give me uh, the vector that I want to go in, multiply it by the speed that, again, I have as a value range for my fish, so they're all moving at slightly different speeds. And then I lerp that with the original velocity. This is another thing that I've added in that basically stops all the fish from having that uniformity. So uh, what I found when I added this in as um, when I didn't have the lerp is that my fish would sometimes reach the target location uh, before that target location had moved on. And the problem with that is that your fish stop, which doesn't look that good. Uh, and what I really want is for those fish to overshoot. Right? I want them to carry on going, and then they can kind of turn back around and start going. So a really easy way to do this is to just have the actual velocity update um, be slower, so that the velocity of its current velocity, it just kind of keeps, uh, but then it kind of slowly updates to the new one. And that's all that lerp is doing. It's basically just uh, got a velocity update, and it goes through and just uh, changes those variables over time. And then I'm just setting my particles.velocity. So again, there's no um, output from this. It doesn't actually you know, kind of uh, show you uh, anything that you can edit. Again, it would be really simple to expose that and then set that in. So uh, at the moment, I've got uh, offset, which is set as a module. I'll just use one that's been already created. Um, so this can be set to any uh, any vector I want, really. So um, I can have a look at, you know, kind of what's available in particles, uh, and really I could choose anything within that. So I could tell it to actually use scale, right, if I wanted to, uh, as the offset. So based on uh, the size of the particle, 
that would be the offset that it was actually using. Um, and what you could then tie that in, so basically uh, you could uh, do a bit of maths to inverse that, so your smallest fish are actually on the outside uh, and your bigger fish uh, are on the inside. So there's loads of different ways that you can kind of tie this stuff in and tie it together. Uh, and that gives you the, the final effect. And there's our fishies. Yay. Uh, and then to just quickly look at um, a few of the other examples as we've still got a few minutes. Um, this is my fuzz. So again, all I'm doing here uh, it's really simple. Uh, what you can do is you can uh, basically retrieve the, uh, the data from static meshes, textures, skeletal meshes, and then you can do really interesting stuff with that data. Uh, so in this instance, I'm just sampling uh, the mesh. And what that does is it gives me a load of information. So it will um, give me the color uh, of that particular point in space. It gives me the location. Uh, and I'm doing that on a per uh, particle basis. In this instance, I'm just using it on spawn because it's a static mesh. It's not going to move, so I don't need to actually uh, update anything based on that. Uh, and then I'm just setting a, a random rotation uh, for my uh, for my particle just to give me a little bit more variation on the actual mesh, and that gives me this kind of like fuzzy overlay. Uh, and again, if you want to have that apply to a mesh, all you have to do is just nest it uh, within the actual mesh itself. And if we go to our fur example. And for the fur, that's doing exactly the same thing. So at the moment, it's just taking in the base normal. So you can see we get this kind of rough fur outline for our object, um, which again is really cool. Uh, all I'm doing is I'm initializing that skeletal mesh reproduction. So I'm saying this is the base mesh that I want you to use. Again, you can, uh, if you expose this at a system level, you can actually set the mesh that you want it to use in Blueprint or uh, in the scene, however you want. Uh, and then because it's a skeletal mesh and it's moving, I need to tell uh, that uh, those objects that they need to update their location uh, based on the offsets of the skeleton. Again, this is a preset module. Uh, you just update mesh, uh, and that will uh, just tie this stuff in. Uh, lastly, I just want to uh, pimp a really, really good resource, which is the content examples. Uh, if you haven't been down this little road yet, uh, I highly recommend doing so. It's an absolutely awesome way uh, to get started and uh, get learning. It goes all the way from, you know, kind of like the really simple stuff. And as you kind of progress down, you get uh, the really complex things like, you know, kind of like this guy, uh, which is having multiple, uh, multiple elements that are kind of tying together and reading data uh, from one another. Um, and again, using kind of like combinations of different variable sets, uh, collision as well, um, which is a really nice one on just telling you how to get collision started, because uh, that can be uh, a little bit finicky to get uh, to get working uh, when you're first going through. Uh, and then, uh, you know, kind of things like this one is really useful for learning uh, updates and just setting uh, instances and calls across different particles. Um, so lots of really, really useful information in here. Highly recommend that you go through this stuff. Again, all of the objects you can click on and you can access. You can see what they're doing. If they've made uh, custom modules for it, if I can click on this damn thing, uh, you can open up every single one of these so you can find out what it's doing. Uh, so you can kind of go into all of these different elements and go, you know, let's have a look at mesh, rotation, scale, figure out how all of these things work, uh, and then you can start building your own on top of that. Okay. Uh, we're done. I hope this was useful. Mm -hmm.